But uh, today we're kicking off the breakout session with our first speakers, Frederick Korsbach and Lincoln Dale, who will be co-presenting Deep Dive on AWS Networking Infrastructure. Frederick is a senior infrastructure business developer in the AWS networking team. Lincoln is a senior principal engineer for global connectivity and network availability at Amazon Web Services. Welcome to Nanog, Frederick and Lincoln. It's a pleasure to have you both speaking with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Welcome and uh, thank you for uh, being here today. Um, we've got quite a lot of things to uh, talk about today. Um, Frederick and I are going to go through uh, a few different things. Um, we're pretty excited to talk about this. I think this is actually the first public presentation that we've done talking about some of our infrastructure and how we've put it together. Um, this has been a, a journey for AWS to owning our own uh, destiny, uh, running on our own equipment, our own hardware, our own software. And the goal of this is to talk about that. Um, as with all things, it's uh, been a, a function of many, many, many people. Frederick and I just get to talk about it and uh, uh, take the credit for it. But in fact, there's uh, many, many, many people at, at uh, AWS that helped make this happen and uh, have enabled our journey to running on these things. So with that as a background, let's jump into what we're going to look at. OK, so in terms of an agenda here, um, we hope that there's going to be a bit of something here for everyone. Uh, Frederick will start uh, talking about our global infrastructure and, and what that looks like. Um, we'll talk about our journey to reinventing our uh, networking on our own equipment. Um, we'll talk about um, the network architecture, uh, the tools, the controllers, the systems, and the choice points of why we've gone down this journey. Um, and then. Uh, uh, some of the learnings that we had uh, along the way. With that in mind, I'll pass to Frederick. Thank you very much, Lincoln. So with every network presentation, you've got to start with maps, right? So if we start with this as kind of the boilerplate here, this is a map of the world uh, that we will use kind of to layer the AWS infrastructure on top of this so that we get a full view of what the network looks like. So if we start with the first layer, or kind of the foundational layer, that would be the, the regions, the cloud regions, as you may. Today, we have launched 30, 31 regions, and we have five more coming up. Today, a region for us is typically multiple availability zones, three or even more. Um, and in fact, today, we do have 99 availability zones within the 31 regions. And an availability zone can span over multiple data centers. And regions, that is today where we put our infrastructure, is compute, storage, and where workloads run from. So this is where you would typically consume services such as EC2 or S3 that is most people know about. Next thing, that will be local zones. So that's kind of the next step for us. So this is where we provide uh, AWS compute, network storage, and some other select AWS services closer to the edge. Uh, these provide a low latency uh, and a single digit millisecond uh, to meet data residency requirements. And the slide series says that we have uh, 25 av available today, or 21 actually, and 30 coming soon. Uh, keeping this slide up to date is actually pretty hard since these are rolled, rolled out incrementally over the year. Uh, a fun fact actually, here in Seattle we have a local zone just a few milliseconds away, which you will probably use at some point during the day. Next will be CloudFront. So CloudFront is our CDN, and today we have over 450 CloudFront pups uh, located all over the world. From these, we serve content directly to you um, and to, to all the end users. Um, and we have added more CloudFront pups uh, this year than all previous years combined. And we continue to deploy more of these pops uh, as we go along. And it seems that the, the need for this capacity is, is an ever-growing um, uh, you know, uh, bucket of need, right? So the thing is, not all our connectivity is, is related to the internet though, and in more than 115 of these locations, we also provide direct connect. Uh, and this is where we provide direct connectivity to our customers for the ones that need SLAs, you know, VLAN support, and a couple of other features that's simply only available over direct connect or cloud interconnect or whatever you want to call them. Customers can use these to connect directly within their VPC and their infrastructure uh, without going over the public internet. So 
If we layer all of these things together or all, all these dots together, yeah, you know, we're starting to blanket the map here. And really the only thing that's missing from this picture is the thing that connects all of these dots together. And that's our backbone. Um, and this is the AWS backbone as it looks today. Uh, it connects all of our regions, all availability zones, and all points of presence together. Uh, today, we light most of our backbone using 400 gig links. For most of it, we use our own infrastructure. It's the fiber that we own. We light it up ourselves. We use DWDM everywhere. And where possible, uh, we also use the routers that we build ourselves that we will talk more about today. We run encryption on every link. and. Um, also offer that to customers through Direct Connect so everyone can use MacSec wherever they want to go. Today, we're serving 255 countries and territories with this network. And most likely, this is one of the most highly scaled and purpose-built global networks out there. And it continues to grow at an incredible rate. Um, one thing we wanted to talk about is Thursday Night Football. I wanted to give a big shout out to everyone in here that has helped us scale uh, to deliver this type of content. Um, and essentially land Thursday Night Football on Prime Video. I think every um, ISP in the US has been in contact with, with our team to help us scale both with peering and build out new data centers, build out new edge pops, get embedded pops in, inside different ISPs. And this is really where kind of the rubber hits the road for us, to, so to speak. And it's a good segue into what we want to talk about so much and why we want to land capacity at this big scale, at this type of velocity. So I'll pass back to Lincoln and talk about how we've done some of that. Thanks, Frederick. Okay, so getting into sort of what we've done in terms of reinventing our network and kind of where this started as a journey for us is we weren't happy with the direction things were going in terms of as we scaled the network, how available it was. So we took the opportunity to take a clean sheet of paper and look at that and decide, well, if we had a blank sheet of paper, what would it look like? What would we want the devices to look like? What, we want, what would we want the network to look like? How would we want those things to work together? Where does it make sense to have controllers? Where does it make sense to use existing protocols? Um, where does it make sense to, to use existing equipment? And for us, really, what this came down to was starting at the very beginning of what do our customers want? Everyone wants a highly available network. They want a highly performant network. Ideally, they want a network that they just don't see. It just gets out of the way. And so that is ultimately the goal. But then for us, it was kind of like, well, how do we go about achieving that? And really, um, it was a function of, well, we need to make simplicity scale. Um, the biggest challenge that we have, and, and in fact, anyone with any large network is, as your network gets larger, you've got more demands on things like control plane protocols. To address those, you turn on more nerd knobs, more features to address some of those shortcomings. You increase complexity. You turn those things on, you have potentially you hit bugs, you hit things. And so the cycle kind of continues. For us, it was an opportunity to look at it slightly different. We did have the benefit of many, many, many years of running our own hardware and our own software inside the data centers. And then it was a case of, well, could we take what we've done inside the data centers and deploy it outside the data centers? And the reality is, yes, we could do that. So what we've done here is really something where um, our network devices, they our own hardware, um, they're our own software. Um, they are here, you can see them. I mean, we've got some pictures of them coming up, but they, they are in the, the room outside as well, if you want to have a I look at them, or at least I look at great big heat sinks. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but for us, it was we could get back to basics of networking. How do we want this thing to scale? Um, do we want things like a, a global IGP with a global blast radius? And the answer is uh, obviously no. You don't want to do that if you can avoid doing that. So that's what we did, right? So it gave us a lot of opportunity to explore trade-offs, uh, different ways of doing things, what are the pros and the cons, but always get back to the benefits, right? What do we want from the network? What do we want the convergence to be? What do we want the scalability to be? Um, what do we want the performance to be? How easy or hard do we want to make it to scale and, and land clients and land capacity? And um, you know, we've been on this journey and it's been a, a huge part of what actually enabled us to land Thursday Night Football in an incredibly uh, short period of time. So with that in mind, um, if we go forward, 
Our basic building block of this thing right now is a 12.8T switch. And in fact, there's a 12.8T system on chip. There's a picture of it here. Actually, clearly it's not a picture of it. That's a picture of a, uh, in PowerPoint, of a device. <laughs> That's what the device actually looks like, right? So this is one of the kinds of devices that we actually have deployed here. Um, there's just, you know, it's really just a sea of heat sinks, uh, truth be told. But the key aspect of this is our building block here is a 12.8T system on chip. So it's a single forwarding ASIC under there. Um, that's it, a single chip device. And we're big, big fans of that from a reliability perspective, just because they fail in very simple ways as opposed to modular devices or multi-chip architectures where often you get gray failures that are very hard to detect and, and uh, have other issues. So this is our building block. It doesn't have to be 12.8T. Uh, that was just the best at the time to start deploying on. We've been deploying for many, many years now. Um, this could be the next iteration up. It's just this is the current best one from a, a price performance perspective. Um, so we take these and then we put them in a rack. And this is actually our unit of how we add capacity inside AWS. Um, this is 100 terabits. And so we take 32 of these devices, we put them in a rack, and there's 100 T of usable capacity. We used a picture of one, here's one, just looks like a rack, nicely cabled up. And in fact, this is sort of what we ship around the place and, and then what we plug up. Now, for those of you that may be uh, quick on doing math here, um, 100T is not what 32 12.8T devices gets you. It actually gets you 400T. When we call it 100T, it's 100T usable capacity for us. So where we connect clients, uh, ports, is it something I said? <laughs> <laughs> um, but in fact, there's 400T there for connecting the rest of the fabric together. And in fact, the rest of the fabric, how this actually works is, these are just ports that we connect things into, but then we can scale horizontally from this. And in fact, this fabric, we can actually scale outwards to up to 32 racks of capacity or 3.2 petabits, 3,200 terabits worth. Um, for us, this is our building block of capacity. And kind of what this doesn't show, but one of the cool things that we're actually doing here is this capacity for us, we're not actually, it, it's more like a, a data center fabric in terms of it's a clove fabric and, and that's how we connect things up. But for us, we've built something where we don't care what the ports are actually doing, what we're connecting to them. So we might have internet peers attached on one port, we might have EC2 attached on another one, we might have local zones or CloudFront or Direct Connect or any of our internal customers that we're providing the connectivity for, and we can scale that out how we want to. So this is actually something that we do for our own reasons for deploying capacity, but one of the things that we've actually done along the way is we've collapsed all the traditional layers of networking that you might have, where you might have core routers, or you might have edge routers, or you might have internet facing, or you might have LERs and LSRs, or uh, core aggregation edge, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, and for us, we've used the same class of devices in all of those things, and in fact, we've actually just used the same devices full stop. And so this is a dramatic thing that has, helps us scale and add capacity, and really helps us deploy lots of capacity in a very short period of time. Um, with that, I'm going to pass back to Frederick to talk a little bit more. Thank you very much. So aside really from the network devices themselves, by moving to a cloud network, we also shift a lot of the complexity into the actual interconnect. So the ones that have been around, you know, we have a break from 10 gig, and we're moving at a pace to 40 gig, although that never really made it into the internet edge. We have 100 gig, and now we're up to 400 gig. So this um, regular type of speeds, that also you know, created a, um, a tweak to our design every year. And a new rev of every cable type, every type of connector, everything changes every time. So as you can see in this picture, this is one of our major problems with this type of design. Uh, we like direct attached cables for many reasons. Uh, for example, they are uh, low, lowest latency, they are cheap, and um, uh, you, you, you can deploy them on mass, right, which is great. But one of the big problems here is cable diameter. So for 400 gig, one of these typical cables are at 11 millimeters outer diameter. That is not really, not like a garden hose, but almost. Um, and to kind of, to, to, uh, when, when you have this many devices in a single rack, like as Lincoln said, we have 32 devices, and we want to connect these one together. That's 256 different cables. 
cramming all this into a rack, not only uh, is, is a problem for like airflow, but also yes, getting, the, getting them out. How do you get port number 36 disconnected in this, in this picture? That's not very easy. So one of the alternatives that we can do is to work with Active, active Duck with retimers to reduce cable area. Um, and, um, you know, the relatively simple problem of a stiffness of a cable could really require us to redesign how we build one of the fundamental building blocks of the AWS network, which is essentially a rack of routers. And to minimize the impact of this, we started with working with industry partners and sought out active electrical cables, which have retimers and ultimately enable thinner cables without the optical intercommersion. So this took some time, but when available, we could swap them in for the chunky cables there to make it a net win. I'm skipping about the part about having to power them, which is a problem on its own, uh, but we'll touch a little bit more on that later. So this is one of the pictures, uh, how it could look like. As you can see uh, to the right there, we have these uh, fairly chunky uh, DAC cables going in. And to the left, uh, uh, there is more cooling and, um, and uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, and the reason for this is 400 gig set R. Uh, there will probably be multiple presentations today about 400 gig ZR, but one of the things is it's really hard to cool them. And that's why on the left there where you will see where we have the, our DCI uh, interconnect box, which is also available to look at, uh, it requires more cooling to be able to get more air into the device. Um, speaking about 400 gig ZR, we identified early that the target reach of 80 kilometer 400 gig ZR was not really providing the optimum coverage in our network. We work with OIF, which is Optical Innovation Forum, to deliver a longer reach version uh, of the Korean pluggable that's covering up to 400 kilometers. That proved to be the right decision for the time being as the longer reach set R, uh, now called 400 gig set R plus, is becoming widely adopted. Um, another example of innovation is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, we came up with a problem. You may only really see at a scale our optic connectors. When we make connections through a given building. For the past several years, we have QSFP interfaces that can run at either a single connection or a breakout connection. This started for us around 2012 with either 40 gig or 4 by 10 gig speeds. Coming up to modern times, we have 400 gig interfaces, but at times we want to connect at 4 by 100 gig. The industry standard is to use breakout cables and patch a rack purely to handle these connectors. These patching racks are problematic for our data center folks. Uh, because they are passive racks, and they are located right beside the routers, uh, meaning there's no power, in, power coming in and no heat coming out. That's not great for thermal management when you uh, consider a network rack, rack beside. It may emit 40 kilowatts of heat, right? So this patch rack is also taking up a lot of valuable data center space over an entire building. That might up to you know, a whole aisle of the, uh, or an entire aisle of the data center if we have to have these passive racks going in all the time. Um, so, to tackle this, we created a connector type that allowed four standard single mode fibers to connect directly into a single QSFP interface. So, this allows us to eliminate the patch rack. While the, spy sa <laughs> while the space savings are nice, we also eliminated one more connector in the chain, increasing reliability and reducing potential for signal loss. Uh, in working with one of our connector providers who manufactured the initial components, we also made this available commercially on the market for others that have a similar problem. You can go to your typical optical vendor today and buy optics that uses the, the SN connector or the Senko connector. Uh, could also be interesting to know when you troubleshoot these ones, you can just troubleshoot one of the lanes at a time, which I think is fairly valuable if you use a lot of breakout optics in your network. Uh, so we'll switch gears uh, and talk about network architecture. Thanks, Frederick. Okay, so how do we do some of these things, right? We've got a ton of devices. You can imagine that uh, we're deploying 32 devices in a rack at a time. We're potentially deploying multiple racks. You know, Our love for non-modular switches or routers means that we have a lot of devices. Well, we're long since past the ability to actually configure anything by hand at, at AWS. We're well north of a, a million network devices. So everything we have is automated. Uh, it comes from config generation, how we deploy changes in the network, how we do pre-checks, pre post-checks, how we do active telemetry and monitoring, how we do remediation if something goes wrong or how we roll back. And we do all of this without a knock. Uh, it's just business as usual in terms of deploying changes into the network. 
Um, there's actually a lot of things that we do here. Um, there is actually a session uh, by one of our colleagues, John Evans, tomorrow that will actually go into a lot of this in a, in a lot more detail. But essentially, we build a network that we intend can have individual components fail at any stage. Um, you don't obviously want that to happen, but it's uh, everything is wrapped in a way that it's not humans making changes, it's the machine making changes. And it's the machine perpetually moving forward on what the intended state of the network is going to be. And you know, it's, it's really this that helps make it happen. We take a, a slightly different view of it, and you know, if we get to the fabric, um, uh, you know, it's a clove fabric, right? Where there's no real kind of secret there. You could kind of do the math or, or even maybe uh, look at some of the pictures. But it is this clove fabric, and kind of what we've shown here in this picture is like, hey, we could potentially attach 256 internet peers onto this thing. But what it also means is we could be attaching other client types as well. We could be attaching CloudFront. Uh, one of our, yeah, our internal CDN alongside internet capacity. We could be doing backbone links. We could be doing uh, local zones in here. And one of the things that this network has enabled us to do is it provided the flexibility for the business that we can land these different types of connections in different places. And that's really what has enabled us to land all the capacity that we have in the right places with the right things attached to them with the most flexibility. Um, like most things, uh, just as an aside, there's a picture of a cat that is in the picture. Uh, everything is named after cats in our network. Um, for those of you that know Tom Scholl, uh, you would know why. So, but uh, this is a cat. Um, uh, we call this the final cat, and that's the intent of it. It is the final cat. So, so I guess the statistics were right, provided by <laughs> Edward earlier this morning, that, that you know, <laughs> Seattle is a cat town, right? Yep, yep. So. Now, if we uh, look at this, right, um, we've got lots and lots and lots of cables, right? Um, now, we did kind of show some pictures of some of the devices, and we've sort of, if you, you know, we've got one kind of device that, that didn't, uh, that was a 1U with 32 ports. There was another one that was 2U with 32 ports that we're using for uh, DWDM and uh, actually doing encryption as well. Um, so it's not that we actually have one kind of thing that we deploy. We actually have a few different variations, but we've kept it to a very, very small number of permutations. Um, the goal here is we don't actually land different things in different places. Um, we have a single thing that we land as capacity, and you know, it doesn't care if it's inside an availability zone, inside a region. It doesn't care if it's in a transit center inside a region, at an edge site, at a local zone. It doesn't matter. It's actually the same thing. And really, it's that simplicity scales. In terms of how we do this, it's completely zero touch for everything, right? We land the equipment, and uh, it's all automated in terms of um, it will all verify, authenticate, boot up, get its configuration. Uh, very little human involved in, in, in uh, involvement in, in doing that. And it's not to say that we don't value our network engineers. We absolutely do. But what we actually really value is uh, network development engineers spending time to automate repetitive tasks so that they don't have to keep doing them over and over and over again. So, um, One of the things in terms of how we do it, um, uh, this is one of the devices. We actually have one of these sitting out in the room uh, outside for you to, to poke at, right? And uh, so this is one of our variations of devices. And the optic that we have here is a ZR optic. Uh, it's a very high power optic. Um, it's well off the scale of what the power should be. And uh, because of that, uh, it got creative in terms of what we had to do in terms of the hardware design. So we do provide more cooling for this device. Uh, we have a subset of the ports can do crypto. Uh, we can do a subset of the ports because for us, the, the, uh, the other adjacent ports are intended to connect into our fabric, right? Uh, we don't need all the ports to do crypto, but again, this is where us owning the end-to-end, -end, we could get creative about what we needed it to do and not more, not anything more than what it needed to do. So here we've got a bunch of ports here that can take high power optics. We also do integrated encryption in this as well. So we actually encrypt everything. Uh, we use MacSec uh, for anything that leaves an Amazon facility. And um, uh, these are the kinds of devices that we're using and doing uh, to do that. We don't have to deploy additional devices to do that encryption. We don't have to deploy other devices to do this DWDM either, if we can do it with ZR. 
So it's completely integrated in terms of doing that. Um, switching gears slightly, and we can talk a little bit about what we do in terms of the software itself. So this is kind of your typical stack that you might have if you uh, looked at what was actually on a networking device. So at the bottom of the stack, you have uh, something like a network ASIC, and you know it's probably plumbed into the PCI bus and connected to a, a control plane CPU in some way. On top of that, you'll typically have an SDK that is programming that chip or programming the forwarding entries that software can talk to. Um, most things are Linux-based these days, and uh, we're no exception. It's just, you know, it's running Linux. And then on top of that, we run a whole series of things inside user space. Now, for us doing this, um, I'm sure many, many people here who have had to scale their network over the last year or two, there's been many, many supply chain challenges and, and long lead times for getting things. For us, for the most part, we haven't been impacted by anything or it hasn't impaired our ability to land capacity. Primarily, the reason we can do that is, in terms of doing this, we control the end-to-end. -end. So it's our supply chain that we have here. We're actually multi-sourcing the ASICs that are used for forwarding here as well. And we've abstracted all of those things away. So for the most part, um, it's enabled us Again, getting back to the business requirements of what we want, it's enabled us to meet those requirements in terms of landing the amount of capacity that we needed to at the right time and uh, uh, in the right place. Um, so this is kind of, you know, the, there's, there's no real kind of magic in, in terms of this. Getting back to the simplicity statement, you know, what we have here is something very, very, very basic in terms of what actually runs on the device itself. Um, we don't use huge numbers of features or functionality on these because we don't need to. Um, one of the advantages we have in, say, something uh, like uh, AWS is um, we almost have control over every aspect of how packets are forwarded in our network. And because of that, you know, we have control over at least one end of the connection. So we can do some really interesting things in terms of the abstraction layers between those. If we looked at, let's say, how we do, you know, you might have a question of like say, well, what do we run in terms of routing protocols? Or what do we run in terms of protocols on this? Well, it's your normal kinds of things, right? So we don't run a routing protocol other than BGP, right? We don't need to throw away BGP to do what we do. In fact, BGP does really good things in really good ways. There's lots of network engineers that understand that. And, you know, that's exactly what we want to happen. Um, but there might be things where, for example, BGP doesn't do exactly what we want, or we don't like its failover times, or we don't like uh, some nuance of maybe you can't do eBGP confed and mix it with a, uh, a non-confed ASN. Well, okay, we can go modify that. Uh, maybe we don't like LACP timers, uh, but maybe we don't want to go to BFT for doing that. We have the flexibility of doing these things. So um, now you've got to be kind of careful with this. We don't want to deviate significantly for no good reason. Uh, we want to do everything with a carefully considered approach, but it's back to our simplicity scales. We don't want to do things differently unless there is a benefit to us and our customers for doing so. But again, it still gets back to the network just gets out of the way. No one should even know it's there. And uh, that's kind of the, 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 the primary part of it. So taking a slightly different uh, direction uh, to look at some things. If you were outside um, AWS and did a trace route to us, and this was me, uh, my home broadband doing a trace to Amazon.com, ends up in a CloudFront server. That's not unusual in itself, but you get all these hops of stars. Uh, that's not very nice, is it? <laughs> Why? Well, turns out we have so many network devices that we didn't want, and, and uh, public IP addresses are somewhat expensive. Um, so we numbered things out of RFC 1918 and 3330 and, and other places. And uh, that's why you aren't getting responses from those hops along the way. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. Other people are doing that. Well, turns out along the way, we actually ran out of RFC 1918, 3330, every piece of address space out there. So we did something that some people have noticed. If you do a similar kind of trace route from inside AWS or inside EC2, you'll see some more of the hops. And some people noticed uh, in Nanog uh, that some of those hops are Class E addresses. Um, 
Yeah, we, we did do that. We started numbering things out of Class E. Um, now, that was very kind of deliberate in terms of doing that. We had no address space left. Uh, we didn't want to spend you know, good money on public IPs for what is infrastructure that you can't otherwise talk to. Um, but um, you know, other people have asked us, like saying, well, does this exclude Class E on the internet or future use? It's reserve space. You shouldn't be doing that. Well, actually, we're just running this in the underlay of our network. What we do in the underlay doesn't have any material impact. If anyone wanted to use Class E for any purpose, they could do that. Us using it doesn't actually change anything there. Um, that said, we are going to change this. Uh, we will make it so that the trace routes do work from outside. And so rather than getting stars like you get here, we will in fact probably start uh, answering from an Anycast address instead. So you won't necessarily see hop by hop in terms of the actual IP address of the device. Uh, we will we'll tag that in some way in the ICMP message to disambiguate what the device is, maybe indicate location in, in some way, shape or form. But this is a main, maybe a, a good example of where we can do things ourselves because we own the end-to-end. -end. This is our hardware, this is our software. We can make it respond to an ICMP uh, time exceeded however we want. Um, but um, yeah, that was just an aside because it has come up in uh, nano discussion a, a few times. Uh, there has been some uh, blog posts on Ripe about it. There's been, I think, even a Reddit thread on it, which is always entertaining to read. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, different people have uh, uh, interesting views of what we were doing there, but actually it was just pragmatic. We're out of IP addresses. One of the things that we did as part of this entire exercise is um, if you're an internet peer with us and you're attached to this device, um, you're still talking BGP in exactly the same way that you did or, or that you do to any other device. If you're doing BGP with TTL 255 sessions with us, it's still the same. If you're doing TTL1, it's still the same. But in fact, we're running BGP off the device itself. So we're actually tunneling BGP from the physical device and, and from the peer specifically through to something running in a container elsewhere on, on uh, lo uh, well, it's actually on local compute that is, that is uh, near the device. We do this for actually a few different reasons. Um, primarily, it's about scalability. Um, we can shard out how we do BGP in a way that we can enable the fastest convergence possible by running it across multiple containers. We could be participating in an IX and have multiple sessions, potentially thousands of sessions, but sending it across multiple uh, compute nodes and spreading out the load. We could be doing uh, yeah, uh, sharding in a way that we're not uh, sharing fate across these sessions. Um, we kind of had to get innovative here. Uh, what this was, you know, we were pragmatic to some extent. We didn't want to burden every network device that we built with a larger CPU or more RAM on the control plane for running high peering sessions or running millions and millions of prefixes. So this is a way that we went about doing this. Um, we still do run things on the device itself. There's, there's things on the device that make sense to run that. So we're running uh, neighbor discovery, neighbor solicitation, ARP, all that stuff. Uh, we're running LACP from there. But BGP specifically, we, we, we move off the device, but we do it in a way that no one really knows about it, right? It doesn't behave any differently. Um, if there was actually a catch, um, you know, you could identify, uh, for those of you that we do peer with, you could identify if you are attached to us, there's actually a couple of ways. The giveaway is a MAC address. Um, it's not gonna be a vendor MAC address, it will be our MAC address. Um, we don't kind of hide that. Uh, the other one that we do um, is if you ping us, uh, if you are the directly attached neighbor, um, you'll get two responses back. You'll get one from the local device and you'll get one from the BGP container. It's only that directly attached device that will get that treatment. Uh, we did that initially just for debugging reasons, uh, but we actually just left it in there. Uh, but every now and again, someone will notice that and <laughs> ask us a question about it. And we go, yeah, that's just how it is. Um, uh, nothing bad happens, you just get a duplicate ping. Uh, or duplicate ping response. Some of the things that we actually have found along the way that are kind of um, curious and interesting was, um, uh, and I've, I've blanked out the IP addresses here to, to, to uh, uh, masquerade it a little bit, but 
Um, one of the things that we found is, I think we're actually the first people actually using Linux for doing neighbor discovery, neighbor solicitation uh, with vendor routers in, in this kind of way. And kind of what we found was a, a quirk of Linux. Um, so when Linux does neighbor solicitation, it uses a, um, a combination of uh, MAC addresses that is a, a little bit unusual. Um, it sends neighbor, solicit neighbor solicitation messages from FE80 addresses, but it's targeted at a non, at, at a unicast uh, IPv6 uh, address. Um, there are some vendor devices that don't necessarily answer that combination, or there are some peers that maybe are filtering messages that look like that. But what would happen is we would get uh, we'd go through a number of um, neighbor solicitation uh, requests. Eventually Linux would time it out, marketers failed, and then it would immediately succeed. And we're going, this is just weird. You know, this would run just like clockwork every, uh, uh, in our case, every 36 attempts over how many seconds it was, and then it would, it would go failed and then it would work. Now, what this turned out to be is there's a setting in Linux called um, multicast resolicit, and by default, it's not turned on. But if you turn it on, what Linux would do is it will flip in terms of how it does the neighbor solicitation. And you can kind of see this in the output at the bottom here where we did a, a TCP dump of, of doing it. And um, uh, it means that you actually end up with it sending to the FFO2 uh, address, the, the the, the link neighbor itself for doing the solicitation. It wouldn't do that within the default settings. Um, this was just kind of curious because um, it's amazing the number of things that we've discovered along the journey that you kind of have to get back to your basic troubleshooting of very much in the weeds of how some of the protocols work. But it was sort of clear to us that like uh, we've, we've certainly traversed a path that it feels like no one else has traveled before. And uh, uh, it's, it's good to be a uh, it's both good and bad to be the trailblazer in that regard. Um, so, um, With that, I'm gonna hand uh, back to Frederick to uh, close up. Yeah, and uh, our little timer box here on the floor says that it is essentially over. Uh, we would obviously like to thank all of you for listening in. And I think it's a great opportunity as well to talk with us. Like we do have a lot of people from AWS here today and for the rest of the day, we have two conference rooms. Uh, so we have one downstairs here where we actually have these hardware devices with us. Uh, there will be people there uh, that will happy to show it for you. And uh, up top on the 708 or something like that, uh, we have a bigger conference room as well where you can uh, hopefully have good conversations with us. And with that, uh, we are happy to take on questions. We have seven minutes and 54 seconds. So uh, we'll be happy to uh, listen in if anyone wants anything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question about MaxSec. Is it done on the optical itself or on the CPU, on the on the router? Yeah. So in in the I can answer that. So in the in the case of um, the device we have here, so MaxSec is running in a PHY on the device itself. So uh, so it it's not present in the ZR optic. There is currently insufficient power budget. Uh, or heat budget more correctly inside the ZR optic for adding uh, encryption in there. That might change, but uh, this is sort of a, a function of the OIF that made that decision, right? So, Thank you. Did you guys notice anything in, or have to structure anything different in terms of your organization to be able to handle maintaining Building, you know, if you're building your own equipment, how do you maintain it? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I'll, I'll tackle that. And so, in, in we were fortunate uh, to some extent that uh, AWS overall has actually been building its own network equipment for the better part of a decade, uh, and that was what was used inside the data center. So we kind of piggybacked on top of that uh, for the most part, and they were well-oiled executing machines, programs. Um, all the nuts and the bolts that are required to put that together because you know, there's literally uh, uh, yeah, more than a million devices out there that, that are doing that. So we gained the benefit of that uh, being, the play, uh, being in place already. 
Where we did have to make a conscious decision, though, was to use the same equipment, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's where it's a little bit unusual because you know we've used a device or a class of device that is not intended to do this, right? It doesn't have buffers. It doesn't have large tables. Um, it's been built to a certain power profile, um, a certain capacity profile, and we wanted to reuse that as, as much as possible. But uh, yeah, it got back to like, well, does it make sense for us to build our own thing if the if the quantity was so you know, relatively much much smaller, let's say? Um, and we decided it wasn't. Um, but that was sort of baked into well, can we make this work? And you know, we we did work on that and and, and decided that we could make it work. Yeah. So. Uh, Maruf AS two nine one four. Apologies if I missed it, but you you. You said one of your original de design goals was to improve availability. Can you share how much availability, availability <laughs> has improved moving to this? Yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, so I can. So um, I can't give uh, exact numbers, but you know, part and parcel of this is um, uh, one of the tenants was basically, if you want to improve something or if you want to draw a line in the sand and say something is good or bad, you need to measure it and you need to create metrics around that. So we had metrics on uh, where various aspects of our network was at. Um, so in the journey of deploying uh, this, the, the whole purpose at the end of the day has been uh, improving the experience for our customers. And uh, what that means sort of specifically is improve the availability, improve the performance. Um, it's been pretty, uh, pretty good is the short answer. Um, in terms of availability and our internal metrics that we use to, to measure, um, and this is different maybe from what customers would see or what you guys would see. Uh, we have a lot of network capacity, we have a lot of redundancy in place, but you know, it doesn't mean that things don't fail, things go bad. It's just that we have enough systems and, and whatever in place that you don't necessarily see that. But year on year, for a few years now, it's been dramatically better and better than 80% better is sort of the, the trend, and that's a compounding interest thing. So um, it's been a significant improvement in terms of the availability for the things that we care about. So. Steve Wallace, Internet 2. Um, a while back, I did some open flow stuff, and there were schemes like uh, Portland uh, for engineering land behavior and scaling using uh, lower end hardware. I'm just curious if you deploy those kinds of things within your internal network. Yeah, good, good question. So um, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, so um, um, no disrespect to anything OpenFlow related, but we didn't really want a centralized controller and the device being completely dumb and stupid and depending on that controller to actually forward anything. We want things that can uh, you could turn it off, you could turn it on, it will come back. Um, so um, now we have done some innovative things in terms of the controllers that we run for programming these things and, and how we do you know, the route redistribution and, and things of that nature, uh, how we do different routing views for different clients, um, how we do the traffic engineering, um, actually just even how we use small table devices. But um, each of these things, uh, again, it gets back to the simplicity scales. Um, we do lots of simple things inside this, and that, and it's the sum of all of those simple things that helps make it all work. But um, did we use anything OpenFlow related? No, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's not really where we needed to be in terms of um, how they how this would work. Right. So, hi, uh, great talk, uh, Randy San Francisco. I noticed you had the uh, Bryce ERP for one thousand kilometers. Is that the main reason you used uh, optics? You yeah. used that bright ZRP optics for that yeah. purpose? Uh, so I think the question is, are we using bright ZR optics? Yes. Right, is it used mostly to drive the distance, like 1,000 kilometer range? Yeah, I, I mean, it, the, the distance bright ZR can go, right, it depends on so many factors. In theory, it can go up to 1,400 kilometers. In practice, it depends on what is the quality of that fiber path and, you know, all the uh, all the things that you have along that path, right? Um, so I think that's an optimistic case. Uh, if you go 1,400 kilometers, you've got to derate it, right? Um, it's got to run at a lower board or lower bit rate. Oh, it's um, near matters, yeah. Yeah, so 
Um, there is a sweet spot, right, as to where we choose to do things. Um, it sort of depends, right? Uh, one of the things about it that isn't available today with ZR is it's only C band. There are parts where we have C and L band, so that makes it uh, non-viable for doing that. Um, but it's all about trade-offs, right? Uh, what do we think capacity is going to go to in a given corridor? How do we uh, go do that in, in the most uh, cost-effective way? But also how do we do that in a way that we can actually deploy, right? Because uh, it might be that for optical things, maybe there's a long lead time. Maybe this gets us something sooner. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. We're basically at time. So uh, come find us later. Thank you. Thank you.